Scott Egan from Closet. Closet Auditors. Please join us at the table. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Um, I wanted to start tonight with the review of the December 31st, 2014 financial report. Uh, I was going to run through um, the main points, the opinions, and some of the changes in the current year report. Through Christy, there are also a number of questions that she would like me to address and, and work through my review. So um, please, at the end of this, if there are any detailed questions or questions that you may have on this, if I've moved too quickly, please just let me know. Um, but Thank I want to make sure I hit all the points mm -hmm. that uh, Christy had, had uh, conveyed to me that you wish to discuss this We evening. appreciate it. Uh, first, I wanted to start you on page one of the audit report, which is your audit opinion. Um, and just to highlight a few items on there, um, just stating what we're auditing. Again, it's the financial statements of the governmental activities, each major fund, and the aggregate remaining fund information of the town of Hampton for the year ended to th uh, December 31st, 2014, and the related notes, which collectively comprise the town's financial statements. Um, our audit was conducted in accordance with government auditing standards. And as opposed to prior years, this is actually the first year um, that the town has received an unmodified opinion on its financial statements since the implementation of GASB 34. Um, there were two deficiencies that caused an adverse opinion for the governmental activities uh, financial statements, which are your government-wide financial statements. Firstly, uh, capital assets were omitted uh, previously, and uh, Christie and her staff have, um, they undertook the, the <laughs> large process of accumulating the information uh, to record all of the town's assets, including infrastructure, uh, and that was implemented for this fiscal year. Uh, there are detailed notes that lay out the breakdown of the capital asset activity. Uh, but I wanted to address that firstly. Um, uh, again, it was a large undertaking. Um, I don't think, I want to say maybe two weeks ago, we came up with the final revisions and had all of the questions answered uh, to be able to issue this report. So it certainly caused the delay uh, in the issuance of the 2014 financial statements. <coughs> with the the bridge that is the GASB 34 capital asset implementation being crossed. Um, I think that all parties will look forward to a quicker financial report next year. Um, it was a large undertaking. Again, we're looking at historical infrastructure. And if you just take a look at when the town was supposed to implement, the town is considered a, a phase two government for GASB 34, which means that implementation was required in 2003. So beyond just the historical work, uh, Christy and her staff had to actually go from 2003 forward. And there are a lot of stakeholders involved. Um, some of the things that I think delayed the issue were change in personnel at various departments who have knowledge of some of the assets, as well as uh, working with the software vendor to make sure that the output of the reports was adequate for the needs of the financial statements. And those items all got ironed out in turn. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, we were able to issue an unmodified opinion on the financial statements. Uh, the other statement, uh, there was one other reason, again, for an adverse opinion, um, and that was related to uh, noncompliance with GASB 45, and that is a standard related to other post-employment benefits. Uh, essentially, for the town of Hampton, what that is is a, a statement that required an actuarial calculation uh, of the cost of maintaining retirees within your health care pool. It created something called an implicit rate subsidy, which needed to be calculated in a set of disclosures, which are found within this report, um, that again had to be contracted by a certified actuary to uh, go ahead to get all the required documents um, and disclosures for this year's report. Both of those were, were obtained this year and allowed the unmodified opinion on these financial statements. In addition to the general financial statement audit, there was also a compliance audit or a single audit due to the receipt of more than $500,000 and uh, due to the expenditure of more than $500,000 of federal funds during the year. 
uh, beginning on page 45, we also have opinions related to the single audit or the federal compliance portion of this. Um, and what I want to draw your attention to is page 48, which is schedule one, which is a schedule of findings and question costs. It's a little easier to see what the town's opinion is here. As we just uh, discussed, on the financial statements, the town received an unmodified opinion with no material weakness or significant deficiencies um, and no material noncompliance related to the financial statement. So basically, um, there were no major, in addition to the numbers being fairly stated, there were no major control issues that gave me a concern as an auditor to say there's a potential misstatement within the financials. On the federal award section, similarly, there were no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies identified, and the compliance opinion was unmodified as well, which again is a, is a clean opinion, if you will. Um, and this was based on the audit of the uh, capitalization grant, grants for clean water state revolving funds uh, that were received during the year. And, and I won't spend a lot of time on the single audit other than to let you know that uh, it was a favorable opinion, and there's a schedule of the federal funds uh, on the following pages that you can review if you have any questions on that. Uh, and I apologize to start jumping around a little bit, but really the financial report uh, for the town kind of starts in the back and builds forward. Uh, and what I want to start with is a summary of your general fund budgetary analysis, and this is basically what you're concerned with for budgetary purposes, for DRA, for tax rate setting. Um, so it's most commonly what is used, I think, as a metric for budgeting. So I start there and then build up to some of the financial reporting questions. Because he has I, the floor. We're going to do I, it. Excuse He's going to make his presentation, May and then I you will have your chance to talk. I ask a question? I won't be able to remember by the time Mr. Egan is done all that we've gone through, and I have a couple of questions on what he has already mentioned. Make so notes. may we have a chance for a couple? Make notes. Please continue. Uh, if you could please go to page 42. Um, this is a summary of the changes in your unassigned fund balance for the general fund. And there are a couple of points I, I wanted to to go over here. This is, again, a summary of your general fund operations for the year. Um, this is a, a true budgetary accounting without any financial reporting combinations. Uh, the town began the year with basically $4.8 million in unassigned. Um, previously, you would have called that unreserved fund balance prior to GASB 54 of unassigned fund balance. Uh, then there's a summary of the changes. The first one is the amount that was reduced uh, of surplus used to reduce the tax rate from the prior year, uh, which resulted in a million dollar reduction in the fund balance. Then you have the results of the operations next, which is uh, showing a revenue surplus of 371000 and an unexpended balance or an under expenditure of your appropriations of $296,000. What page again? Uh, this is page 42. 42. Wrong page. Thank you. Gotcha. Uh, the details of the operations uh, of the budgetary operations can be found on page 39 through 41 and um, you know of note here really looking at page 39 which are your budgeted versus actual revenues um, the really the, the only major thing here you could see as far as a variance is uh, related to property taxes which was due to a large abatement which um, in accordance with accounting standards is charged against the revenue during the year um, which I'm sure everyone is aware of there. Um, other than that, the majority of the uh, income was in line with expectations. Um, there were some additional permit fees received in, uh, in, a, in addition to what was expected with the budget, which is consistent with a lot of communities. Um, motor vehicle registrations have been favorable across the state in most of my audits, just as the economy has recovered a little bit. Um, in addition, there were also some additional water pollution grants, which uh, you received funding for this year. Um, basically, they're reimbursements towards debt service on some of the previous projects that you had undertaken, and those all kicked in this year uh, prior to uh, actually being included in the budget. So all of those things resulted in some of the favorable revenue variances. Uh, if you look at page 40, um, 
there really isn't <coughs> things are pretty much in line again with the budget um, in the front of the audit um, there's a, a management discussion and analysis which Christy has prepared um, you know which indicates that basically um, you know within about a percent and a half of budget is where you where you landed um, you know there are some things typically that you know might have been budgeted in an area charged to another that um, there's no you know a savings in one area rather that uh, you know you used to spend out of another without a formal budget transfer so it's common to have minor variances but there's not much of of note in relation to the total budget on these pages uh, but again that's where you would get that detailed information of the department level uh, expenditures and results uh, the next section as far as the components of the changes in fund balance is a little bit more technical uh, you have to account for the changes in other restrictions to fund balance and there are different levels of restrictions based upon the type of um, the type of imposition whether it's an external restriction or it's something that management has designated or it's something that was voted at town meeting they all have various levels of restriction in accordance with GASB 54 and this is a summary uh, below of an increase in non-spendable fund balance which is generally an increase in most commonly prepaid items or inventory. Scott, what page is this? This is, sorry, this is on page 42. My apologies. 42. Up at the top on 42. A, a decrease in committed fund balance of $28,000. Uh, that, again, is related to um, typically to items voted at town meeting, a change in prior year. Let's say there was uh, 200000 and then 200000 20, uh, 228000 That would account for the change there. Uh, and the decrease in assigned fund balance for abatement contingency. Um, as I mentioned, there was a large abatement passed through uh, or charged against revenue during the year, resulting in the recalculation of that contingency, which is a balance sheet item at year end. And that, that abatement contingency, um, you know, in review with legal and the assessing department was significantly decreased. That's where it shows on the financial statements. Uh, what this brings you down to is an unassigned fund balance of five million four hundred fifty seven thousand five oh five uh, this is the fund balance that you actually report to dra mm -hmm. and that they're concerned with for tax rate setting purposes when they try and evaluate what potential fund balance is available to be used with your ensuing warrant articles that you're working on uh, so for 2014 the the number is five million four hundred fifty seven thousand um, dollars below this there's a reconciliation to some of the other financial statements here these are budgetary financial statements but you're also required to present two other types of financial statements uh, governmental fund financial statements or general gap basis financial statements and government-wide financial statements so this reconciliation shows the differences between your budgetary fund balance and your financial reporting gap fund balance <coughs> the main difference is there is a more restrictive view of what can be called revenue in your governmental fund or gap basis financial statements which could be found on page let me go here um, starting on page 10. Okay. this pre presentation is slightly different it breaks out the general fund but the general fund also includes blended trust funds and some other items that aren't that are different than budgetary purposes. It also presents uh, the town's other major fund, the permanent fund, and all other funds as one uh, consolidated unit and aggregate amount. Um, the difference here is due to something called a 60-day rule, which under the basis of accounting for this financial statement, you're only allowed to record revenue that was received within 60 days of fiscal year end. Uh, there was a change that we have presented as a restatement to the governmental fund fund balance related to this after consultation with GASB. Um, previously, this number and one of the questions was that this number in, in prior years had been much higher uh, as far as the difference in revenue between the two statements. Um, one thing that we had always viewed as a firm, um, if, you, if you take a look at tax collection in New Hampshire were kind of unique and it doesn't exactly fit the GASB model um, they're more based on a county collection system more commonly than how taxes are collected here by the local towns and then 
Uh, typically, they have different <laughs> fiscal years than their school, and they're holding money cross period for the school. So, what had been done in previous years and was common practice in the state was to consider the entire amount of the uncollected tax balance and only count um, what was received, defer everything that wasn't received within 60 days of year end. But if you take a look at the financial statements on page 10, um, there is a large liability, an intergovernmental payable of $13 million. And in the notes, there's the exact amounts, but the majority of that money are balances due to the Hampton and Winnicott school districts due to the timing difference in your fiscal year ends. The taxes that were collected on this warrant that is outstanding and still receivable, uh, partially receivable, those revenues, 13 million <coughs> is pledged to the district. However, due to their cash requirements, in their fiscal year end, they have a predetermined payment schedule and you haven't paid that out yet. So what we have done is only considered in consultation with GASB and we wanted to get their guidance from their technical team on this, was we felt that deferring the entire amount related to this was unfairly decreasing the net position of the general fund because this amount is included in the liability. <coughs> so we have only included the proportionate amount that relates to the town, and that is based upon the, the town's percentage of the overall tax commitment. Um, because again, we felt <coughs> it unfairly penalized New Hampshire communities in the situation where you have a, a calendar year end town and a fiscal year school that is already carrying an intergovernmental payable to essentially, um, it would be double dipping that revenue recognition. So that was one of the things I know that Christy wanted me to cover. Um, that is a change here. And again, um, based upon the discussion, <laughs> we presented that as a, as a restatement to fund balance. We recalculated the beginning fund balance. And going forward, um, that will be the methodology <laughs> for calculation um, that's been agreed upon um, you know, between Christy and, and myself as far as uh, how that's looked at. Um, and then finally, there's a small, again, without getting too technical on you, there's also other adjustments um, also related to the 60-day rule. You don't, you don't recognize an allowance for uncollectible taxes um, on these statements because you already have that 60-day cut off. So anything that's in an allowance would de facto be not collected in the 60 days already. Um, and that comes down to your fund balance, your unassigned fund balance of four million six hundred forty one thousand one hundred eighty one dollars and that is what flows to page 10 in your governmental fund financial statements um, page 10 uh, through 14 or through 13 rather are your governmental fund financial statements and reconciliations to the um, reconciliations to the government wide statements which we'll get to in a minute um, and again, the majority of the assets are in cash at year end. Um, you also have the large property tax receivable, which we have discussed, and the main uh, payable amount being uh, the school district payable of 13, approximately, thir it's a little over 13 million. There might, I think there's $1,000 or so due to the state in that as well. Um, taking a look at your other fund balances, um, again, you have non-spendable fund balance of 136000 again, related to prepaid items and, and tax deeded property inventory that's being held. Mm -hmm. uh, restricted val uh, fund balance of $177,000. Committed fund balance of $2.5 million. That is mostly related to trust funds, expendable trust funds that are included in the general fund now for reporting. Uh, in, uh, for reporting purposes, and an unassigned fund balance, which is mainly uh, budgetary encumbrances of 816000 um, And again, we come back down to that $4.6 million that we discussed. Um, the permanent fund, uh, again, mainly that's your real estate <coughs> trust fund, um, and that balance is um, included in the second column. Your other governmental funds, um, those are all other 
funds of the district that have not been blended into the general fund and those funds um, there are individual um, or combining fund financial statements that uh, let's see what page they begin on here that begin on page 42 I believe in this 42 um, 43 and that shows you again if you're looking for the other information you're only required this is not a required schedule you're required to report it in one column but this is just an additional breakdown that we provide for uh, just for transparency in general disclosure it helps people track things over time uh, and we found it useful to include uh, lastly I wanted to just highlight the on the financial statement and I just wanted to highlight the governmental activities and this is the accumulation of everything that you've seen on uh, page 10 and page 12 as well as additions of uh, capital assets and long-term liabilities mainly the debt um, that is associated with your capital assets um, so you see approximately 50 million dollars of assets related to the net book value of capital assets that was brought on during the year um, and again you ha you've already been recording the outstanding debt and their debt schedules and amortization schedules in the back of the audit you've already been recording that but what it's done is it's increased your net position um, and basically shown a net investment in capital assets now of 26 million dollars prior to that you didn't have that offset of the asset against the debt and you were in a much um, different financial position you can see that again this is as restated if you look at page nine so uh, if you were to look at the 13 report you get the true difference of bringing this on but we calculated the beginning balances of all of these to show the the change during the year rather than saying you know you increased your net position 50 million dollars it's shown as just the change that occurred in 2014. Um, there were a couple of other items that Christy asked that I, I speak about that we've been in in discussion about that I wanted to bring up um, and they both apply to future Gatsby pronouncements that are coming down the pike um, the first one is Gatsby 68 and that is essentially the recording of the town of Hampton's percentage of the New Hampshire retirement systems net pension liability on the financial statements of the town uh, GASB 68 is effective for this fiscal year for the December 31st 2015 fiscal year and it requires the uh, recording of a large liability and other related items it's actually a very technical standard and other related items to this pension liability um, on the financial statements next year and uh, again it is timely that you have implemented capital assets because that will severely impact your net position next year going forward um, it's a new financial it hasn't changed the funding for your pensions but it's a new financial reporting requirement that says of the total amount that's unfunded um, in actual let me be careful how I phrase it the total uh, essentially actuarial uh, amount that they've determined is unfunded for the retirement system has been broken out based upon your proportionate contribution to the system and has now been allocated down to everyone's balance sheets um, so that will be coming on board next year and without the addition of these capital assets this balance sheet or statement in that position rather would be in a much weaker position to someone from the outside taking a look at that and wasn't aware of the substantial infrastructure and capital assets that Hampton has um, again this is something that mainly is going to be we've already implemented this for our June 30th 2015 audits and mainly um, it's a coordination of work between New Hampshire retirement system and their auditors KPMG as well as us and from the town's perspective we have to do some additional census testing and testing of some of the information that is sent to New Hampshire retirement system but there are uh, the retirement system has actually done a, a new actuarial evaluation um, had that audit had certain schedules that are required for the statement audited um, so it relieves uh, a lot of the burden um, and actually allows us to issue um, you know hopefully another again related to this an unmodified opinion related to that 
the problem with this standard was so much of this information that we're relying on for you is held by the plan. Um, and really the plan being New Hampshire retirement has taken upon itself to uh, follow AICPA best practices and issue the appropriate reports, including opinions from auditors on the schedules that we need to include in your report so that uh, I don't anticipate that being any type of issue uh, with the 2015 audit based upon my experience in this last round of audits uh, of my June 30th, 2015 clients. Um, that's something I certainly want you to be aware of because I think it's going to be, um, as more reports come out and people talk about this, um, it has been uh, typically, it's been, a, it's been a point of interest and a point of confusion um, with a lot of people, but I do want my boards to be aware that this, this is coming down the road. Um, it is applicable to you. Um, you know, myself and Christy are aware of it and it will be included into the next set of financial statements. And so if you do have any questions on that, to please let me know. But if someone is talking about that to you, a net pension liability of the New Hampshire retirement system, yes, that does apply to you. Um, another important thing to note on that too is this is a financial reporting requirement. It is not, um, it does not address the funding. Um, and I don't have the rate off the top of my head, but if you look at the current rates for New Hampshire retirement and firefighters are 27 something, 29. 29. So in, in that current funding amount is um, a built-in component to pay this net pension liability down over the long term, which is something again that they're, um, the retirement system is working on and they're required to do um, I think that's a lot of the reason, the reason behind what Gasby says, and then there's the um, the actual effect of this statement is that people are taking pension funding a lot more seriously, um, and again, so I just like people to be generally aware of that. And if you do have questions, let me know. But yes, it applies to you. Yes, the New Hampshire retirement system has a funding plan to pay this liability down. That's why the the current rates are so high. That's not just paying a current benefit amount. Yeah. Um, and finally, the other item that um, Christy wanted me to discuss was GASB 67, which was basically disclosure requirements for tax abatements. And the statement is going to be effective for your December 31st, 2016 audit. Um, like anything, if possible, they always say earlier implementation is um, encouraged. I don't have any clients that are early implementing this at this point. The main thrust behind this statement is related to, I guess I would say, a mutually beneficial tax abatement where, as an econo economic development tool, um, you know, an example that I have in one of my communities is an outlet where um, there's favorable tax treatment for the outlet based upon the jobs and the general economic development that is brought forward. Um, there was no discrete disclosure of that in audits before, and now um, by tax program, uh, or a tax incentive program, there is going to be a disclosure requirement. And previously there was none. Uh, they went back and forth. It's kind of a midway because there are certain things contractually and whatnot that can't be disclosed about individual taxpayers. But really this statement is meant to give the users of the financial statement, uh, allow them to quantify these types of agreements and how um, how integral they might be to the to the financing and to the revenue raising of their particular community. Um, a component of this uh, is also going to be how to handle additional, um, you know, individual type tax abatements, and that is going to be determined. There's flexibility on that to be determined a lot by town policy. So that'll be something that um, I'll be letting Christy know as some best practices and typical things become available. Um, you know, I'll be making her aware of um, areas that she can research to help advise the board on, on what um, some general practices are for adopting that statement. But again, I know that was a, a general question, but that one's a year off, but um, as things become available, it is one that as a board you're going to want to have to uh, have some general knowledge of and, and some guidance, I think, as to how to um, put together that um, you know, that individual component of the policy that isn't as cut and dry as, as some of the bigger tax incentive program disclosure requirements. Um, with that being said, I think I hit 
everything that Christy and I wanted to talk about, but I wanted to open it up to any okay. questions that you may have. Did you want to add something at this point, Christy? No, nope, I'm good. No. And, um,